Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. It's a program where we take a look at the sacred scripture through the lens of the tradition that goes back to our Lord Jesus Christ that he passed on to his apostles and they to their disciples on through the centuries of the church. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and we are finishing up our study on the Eucharist. Now, of course, we want to have you as a part of the program. You can add your questions and comments. Uh, send us the questions or comments via email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com. You can also go through our social media pages like Facebook or YouTube. So today we'll finish up this whole discussion on the Eucharist. We've been going through it, the, the, the whole topic, using my book, The Eucharist, A Bible Study Guide for Catholics, which you can, of course, still get at EWTNRC.com. It is item T1375. And today we are starting on page 107. Now, just so you get ready, for this, our next series will be How to Listen When God is Speaking, a guide for modern-day Catholics. How do you discern the will of God? How do you know what the Lord is asking of you? These are some of the things that we'll take a look at. You can get that book, How to Listen When God is Speaking, also at EWTNRC.com, religious catalog. It is item number 1833, and we'd love to have you join us for that. Now, if you recall, last week we were talking about the power, the infinite and eternal power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's so important because he taught at the Last Supper, that this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. He begins the new covenant that had been predicted would happen. The priests, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, had prophesied that the old covenant was over. They also predicted that there would be a new covenant. And the first one to teach about that new covenant is Jesus Christ. And that unlike the high priest at the Jerusalem temple who brought the blood of bulls and goats into the Holy of Holies on earth, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is sacrificed and that his blood is brought into the Holy of Holies in heaven. He's in the eternal holy place, not made by human hands, but that is eternal and is the, the basis for everything else. The temple on earth was a model of what Moses had seen in heaven. Jesus Christ, the one true high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, enters into the Holy of Holies in heaven, and that this new and eternal covenant is sealed with his blood. And we also were mentioning at the end of last week's program that his precious blood is precious because of that infinite quality. There is no sin that is more powerful than the death of Jesus on the cross. And it is also eternal in value that there is no time in human history when the shedding of his blood no longer has an impact. One of the points that I think we should make is if you remember in the Gospels of Luke and John, 
it's mentioned that the apostles saw Jesus' wounds. In fact, in John 21, we see that Thomas, the apostle, is told to touch the place where the nails went into his hands and put his hand in his side where the spear entered. That is also significant because it means that these holy wounds from which the blood of Christ flowed are eternal. They were also resurrected with him. And this, by the way, makes a very important point for the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Because the Bible teaches very clearly, we talked earlier uh, when we discussed Isaiah chapter 53, that by his wounds we are healed. Well, his wounds are resurrected. His wounds are raised up and they are still there for our healing just as his blood is forever present for our forgiveness of sins and to receive eternal life. This is very important for understanding the remission of sins. Now, let's go one step deeper and talk about how the blood of Christ has its impact not by an external sprinkling or external pouring, but by entering into the depths of the human conscience. In the Old Testament, the priest would take, the high priest would take the blood of a bull and a goat that he had mixed together in a bowl, and another priest would constantly be stirring it because otherwise it would coagulate. And he would take that blood and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. Something else goes on for us. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13 and 14, where it says, For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Now, this needs to be better understood and unpacked. So first of all, the blood of Jesus Christ is not something you sprinkle on the outside. We don't take the consecrated precious blood of Jesus and just sort of sprinkle it on you. We don't do that at all. The only proper way to deal with the blood of Christ is to receive it, to drink it in. And this is because that brings out how the blood of Christ, that is the blood of the new covenant, enters to the depths of our interior life. And this is extremely important. And that the... Um, uh, the, the, this is the very power of the Spirit of God at work in us. That's why he says that it's through the eternal Spirit that he offered himself without blemish and purifies your conscience. So the Holy Spirit is active and he's an offering to God the Father. This is also important because you never have one person of the Trinity acting separately from the others. In this act of self-offering of God the Son to His Father, 
for the sake of our sins. It is something that is done through the eternal Spirit, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always act together whenever they are dealing with creation. The only time that the Father acts separately from the Son is within the Trinity, where He gives Himself to the Son. And the Son acts as an individual when He gives Himself to the Father. And the Holy Spirit is that self-giving. That the three persons act distinctly within the life of the Trinity, but whenever acting toward us, all three persons are acting together. That is the reason why it is heretical to say, well, I'll be baptized in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. No! All three persons create. All three persons are in the redemption and redeem us. All three persons sanctify us. You don't have any one of them acting separately from the others. That's a heresy called modalism. And we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The politically correct try to change it to fit their ideology, but they end up committing the modalist heresy when they do so. That's why you cannot validly baptize in the name of the, re the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you enter into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, not the names, because the three persons act together in our baptism. So that's very important. And we see the Holy Spirit was present with the Father and the Son at the crucifixion in which Jesus' blood is shed. Take a look at Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Again, all three persons are present in the redeeming death of Christ. This is crucial to act. And this is very much what we see going on here. All three persons are involved. It is the same Holy Spirit who makes it possible to have the blood of Christ penetrate into our consciences. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit who makes it possible for us to have this cleansing of, from our sins. It's Christ offering Himself to the Father and the Holy Spirit is working within us. This is a divine act. This is why we see the redemption as an act of grace. God is the one acting. This is not our own doing. It is God's activity. And then we go on to understand that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, where he says, For this reason he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant so that the sins that we committed against God's commandments, these are, given, are forgiven us because Christ has mediated this new covenant. While th this uh, old covenant promised a long life in the promised land, that's what they were told. If you keep my commandments, you will have a long life in the land which I'm giving you. We see that in the new covenant, there is a promise of an inheritance that is eternal. We're not going to receive a piece of land 
in this world. We're not going to get a territory in this world on the basis of the new covenant that Jesus brought us. Instead, we have an eternal inheritance. We inherit heaven. Why? As St. Paul teaches in Romans 8 and Galatians 4, we are the children of God by adoption. God adopts us into his family. And therefore, with Jesus, we inherit eternal life. That's what the new covenant is for. Not the promised land in a small area of Western Asia, but rather to see that we have an eternal inheritance in heaven. And that this is what we see in this new covenant. In fact, later on in Hebrews, he talks about the new and heavenly Jerusalem. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 22 where he said that instead of going to Mount Sinai, he says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. I say innumerable angels in this trans, but myriads. A myriad is 10,000, so it's 10,000 of 10,000 of angels, namely millions and millions of angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That's the saints, by the way. And to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is what our inheritance is to be, that this new covenant that Jesus Christ gives us is this life in heaven, this new and heavenly Jerusalem. The letter, or excuse me, the uh, book of Revelation describes this new Jerusalem as having the dwelling place of God. The eternal temple is described there. And we see that it's this beautiful place with trees that never fade, that give fruit every month instead of once a year. And that there's no more tears. God himself will wipe away the tears. Life is hard. Life is hard. Many people are weeping as we've gotten up to 300,000 who have died of COVID or, or at least died with COVID. The doctors are revising this. A lot of people died with COVID, but not from it. Um, they said about 50,000 in that situation. But still, there's a loss of life. It's hard. And there are many, and so many of you losing businesses. This is hard. It's how you make a living, how you feed your families. And for a variety of reasons, they, they get closed down. But the Lord will wipe away all those tears and give us eternal joy. That is the inheritance that comes to us from this new covenant. And this is what we look forward to so much so that we again, reaffirm what Jesus our Lord says to us still to this day, that unless you eat my bread, or eat, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. But whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will live forever and will not die forever. This is the promise of the new covenant. All right, we're going to take a little break. I want to come and deal with the question of Jesus entering into heaven once and for all and how that affects the Mass. So please stay with us.
right, we are now ready to deal with one last issue. It's raised by the passage in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 to 28. Let's take a look at that first. Where it says, Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. All right, so let's take a look at this. Because a lot of people say to me over the years, well, it says right here in Hebrews 9 that Jesus uh, did not have to suffer, suffer repeatedly. He appeared once for all. And that, you know, he, that's the only time he dies. Why do you Catholics offer the Mass again and again? Are you crucifying Jesus again and again? I hear that every so often still. And the, cre the, the crucial issue is that phrase, once and for all. First of all, Catholics are very clear. We do not believe that you crucified Jesus again and again. You, no way. He died once and for all. This is Catholic doctrine as it is Protestant doctrine. Christians of all sorts hold that point together. It's written in the scripture and it is what Catholics and Protestants believe together. So that's very important. But we have to understand something about Jesus our Lord. We talked about last week, in fact. The power of Jesus' blood depends on the fact that he is man, completely and fully human, and he is God, completely and fully God. And it's essential for us to understand that his divine nature shares in the absolute eternity of God. God, our Lord, does not have a past or a future. We do because we live within time. But the divine persons live apart from time. They live in true eternity. So what we call past is still present to them and always is present. What we call future is present to the divine persons. It's not something that's going to happen. Well, God already knows the future. No, he doesn't know the future because it's not future for him. For God, it is already right now. Everything is right now. Like a book I wrote in which I tell episodes from my own life, my first book on the New Age movement. It covers about 20 years of my life. But for me as the author, the whole thing is present in one moment. For me as a character in the book, it took 20 years to go through. When we are looking at a whole life, say we write our autobiography, a whole life is present in that moment. Well, for us, but for the characters inside, it takes as many years as you live. So also, God has the whole of human history present to him always. 
It doesn't come into being for him. He doesn't lose the past. It's always all present. Let's bring it down here to where it affects us in understanding Christ's death and resurrection. Christ's saving death is eternally present to him. It's not something of the past. His resurrection, the moment of coming out of the tomb, is past for us, but for Christ it is present. And what is happening in the Mass, when we say that this is the representation of the saving death of Jesus on the cross in an unbloody way, it means that what is eternally present to God in His divine nature, what is eternally present to Him, he makes present to us in that moment of Mass. We don't crucify Jesus again and again at Mass. It's rather that at each Mass, that eternal presence of the crucifixion is made present to us. <coughs> in that moment of Holy Communion, the eternal moment of the resurrection is made present to us. The whole of the Paschal mystery is made present to us. Not because we do it again, but he makes it present to us. What is eternally present to him, he makes present to us here on earth. In that sense, the holy of holies in heaven touches us on earth. The reality of Jesus' death comes to us. And, you know, think about the way Catholics and Protestants share elements of that faith. Almost every Protestant I know believes that they have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Did they kill Jesus again? Of course not. And they would never say that. They don't think it because they didn't do that. It's rather that the same doctrine, the death of Jesus, is present to everybody who comes to him in faith. And in their act of faith by which their hearts are cleansed by the blood of Christ, that becomes present to their moment for them. This is something that is uh, part of their faith when they say they've been washed by the blood of the Lamb without having to kill Him again. It's rather that the shedding of His blood on the cross that is eternally present becomes present in their act of faith. We believe that but also that it becomes present in the moment of the Holy Eucharist. It also becomes present when we confess our sins. He makes it present to us in the confessional. He makes it present by his wounds being scourged and, and uh, open for us to heal us, that, that pre the power of the wounds are made present to us in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. In your marriage, you enter into the dying with Jesus so you can rise with him. That makes present to us. At ordination, the priesthood of Jesus, one on the cross, becomes present to me at the moment that the bishop lays hands on me and ordains me. Every sacrament, becomes present. Baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus is because the power of his death is made present at the moment of entering into the baptismal font. This is key. And it is always present to him, but by his grace in the sacraments, he makes it present to us. And we receive that gift so that the altars of our churches have the one sacrifice of the cross perpetually present to us. He does not have to leave the Holy of Holies in heaven, but he makes it present on our altar, on our holy places. And that's why we reverence the altar. We bow toward it to show respect that this is where heaven touches us. And we don't Treat it just as another table or something. It is where God touches us. And that he makes this a way so that uh, he makes his death and resurrection present to us so that we can take and eat. We can take and drink. 
and enter into this mystery. And he cleanses our consciences. Through. He enters into the deepest part of our human existence. This conscience is what sets us apart from the animals. They don't have a conscience. They don't feel guilty about cheating on their goose wife or goose husband. They have no such thing. They are, they just are animals. We have a conscience and that's where God meets us and he cleanses our conscience by the shedding of his blood and we receive this in the Eucharist. I want us to realize the power of this so that all of us do everything we can not to neglect it. I know at this time of COVID, a lot of places, they don't let us come to Mass. It's got to change, and some of the courts are getting on their case. We need to make sure that as soon as possible, we reassemble in the church and that we worship God and we receive Him and receive the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing of our consciences. And secondly, we do everything we can to invite others to receive Christ, to let them know the fullness of this reality and this truth and this goodness so that they too can share in the reality. It's not about joining the Catholic club or something. It's about eternal life and redemption and being in heaven, which we inherit because Christ brings us into this new covenant of his blood and that we never, ever want to neglect that. And as soon as the, this pandemic is done, as soon as we can, don't we? I know some people are still scaredy cats. They want to say, well, we've got to wait even longer. As soon as we can, get back to church and receive Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity. Whether you receive only the precious body only the precious blood for some people, you still receive the whole Jesus Christ. And by receiving the whole Jesus Christ, he makes us truly whole in the depths of our conscience. This is the great gift from Christ, the bread of life. All right, we've completed that Bible study in that book. Let's take a few of your questions now. We have Mary Lou online. Mary Lou, where are you calling from? Pennsylvania, Father. Wonderful, wonderful. And what is your question? Well, Father, it was a tail end what I heard, and I never did this before call in, so I'm a little nervous. Oh, um, don't you worry. Said you said something about the covenant. You were talking about the covenant, and it was like a twofold thing, and you said something about if, if um, let me see, if you're, if you get the Eucharist, you know the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And then I thought you said something about if um, if you're getting the Eucharist, you'll receive um, um, God in your in your heart Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't get the Eucharist because I'm in a wheelchair seven uh -huh. years. Oh and my! And the priest only came once a month for me. So what does that mean for me? First of all, you uh, bless you, you know, for your, your steadfast faith. And what I would do, if, I, if you can, ask that a Eucharistic minister would bring you the Eucharist more often. The priest may not be able to get there. That, that, that's possible. But an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist can bring you Holy Communion. And for you to, at the very, bare minimum, if you, you're watching TV now, so you can join us at Mass and make an act of spiritual communion until you get a chance to receive the Blessed Sacrament. And you know, last week I had a phone call. Somebody asked, how do we keep holy the Sabbath? Well, let me make a suggestion for those who are wondering, what can I do on holy days like Christmas? What can I do on Sundays? 
um, and um, you know, uh, and you know, I, I want to keep the, the the Sunday holy. Well, one of the things you can do is become an extraordinary minister of the Holy Communion and bring our Lord to people like this who can't get out. She's in a wheelchair. She cannot get out and even before the COVID situation. And you want to talk about making Sunday holy and the holy days holy? Be generous with time and bring our Lord to those who can't receive in person inside the church but can receive at home. And this is something I'm going to ask our folks to do, to volunteer, because I want you to receive the Lord. But you can, at the very minimum, receive Him in spiritual communion. And this is something that um, you know, I uh, you know, pray that somebody will near you will respond to this invitation and, and help you with. Um, but you've already certainly received, you desire Him, and I assure you that that counts as in a salvific way for you to have this, in, this eternal life. Yeah, so don't worry about that, your, your intentions on this. It's more up to the charity of others to help you to continue to receive and be strengthened in an ongoing basis. Keep them out. Keep that in my prayers, too, that someone rises up to help you on this. I have another caller. Hello, Jess. Hello, Father Mitchell. Hi. Where are you calling from? I'm calling, actually, from Northampton, Massachusetts. Wonderful. Wonderful. And what can we do for you today? Father, here is a very long... I've had this question a long time. Sure, sure. I was brought up, I was brought up in a Jewish home. Uh -huh. It was part... My mother was pious, but not orthodox. And I have studied the Old Testament and the New Testament for a long time. Good for you. So I'm in, and of course, how do you not love the words of the Gospels of Jesus? Immediately, it just went into my heart like <laughs> the most delicious of delicious spiritual honey imaginable. So I'm in Israel. I'm studying in a yeshiva, actually diaspora yeshiva, and I got bored during the service. I walked out, and an hour and a half later, God draws me into the Holy Sepulchre Church. I walk into a small room. There's nobody there. A cross of Jesus is beautifully, beautifully yeah. embedded in this wooden cross, and I do a bow to Jesus. My body is bent over in the fetal position. I'm raised about six inches off the ground, literally, and my whole being is blissed and bathed in the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. This goes on and on. I have no awareness of time or space. I'm only experiencing ecstatic Jesus, God's love. Yes. My, my question is this, Father Mitchell. You know the Word of God is the truth. Yep. So the problem is, if the Word of God, and I mean this, because mm -hmm. I've studied this at length for many years. If the Word of God is true in the Old, if the Word of God is true in the New Testament, then the Word of God in the Old Testament cannot be true. The scriptures that I read, for example, and this is the question, and I'll give you a couple of scriptures. My question, Father Mitchell, is can you help me to understand how I can accept Jesus? as my Lord and Savior, and be saved by His blood, when the Scriptures say in Deuteronomy, in the King James Version of the Bible, and other Christian renditions, mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy it says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no Savior before me, and I am the Lord thy God, I give you my Torah, I give you my Old Testament to live and follow, I give you my Torah forever, mm -hmm. thou shalt have no Savior before me, I am the Lord thy God, I give you my Torah forever. Sure. When I read these two things as the word of the Lord, and it says within all of the scriptures also, there is no human sacrifice allowed, no man may be worshipped, there is no vicarious atonement. The whole Old Testament is replete with mm -hmm. the direct relationship is between you 
and God, you ask forgiveness, you make restitution, you do your best not to repeat those sins. Right. And I just wonder how, when it says, I give you my Torah forever, it doesn't say until the King Messiah comes and you will then have a new covenant. It doesn't say you will worship the King Messiah as you worship God. I have these questions and many like Sure. So let me, let, let me re respond. First of all, thank you. Thank you. And um, matter of fact, I remember where the Diaspora Yeshiva is. Uh, and of course, I know the Holy Sepulchre well, um, having been to Jerusalem many times. A couple things. First of all, go back and look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, where our Lord concurs with you. He said, you know, that you don't get rid of the Torah. That he said, anyone who teaches to, to do so is wrong. That our Lord takes Torah, the, the, the commandments of God, and he brings them to a new depth. Think of how in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard that it was written, thou shalt not kill. I say, don't even have revenge, don't even have anger. And we see that again and again as a process there. Our Lord doesn't destroy the Torah, but he takes it to new depth and wants us to understand not just a vague spirit of it, but the depth of it. Secondly, our Lord himself says in quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Shema, that you know, uh, you know that you, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Our Lord cites that, and when we pray at Mass in the Creed, our first act of faith is we believe in one God. There is no other God. There's no other Savior. We don't believe that Jesus is another God or another Savior. We only accept that he is the, uh, the, the second person of the one God. That when he himself talks about how he and the Father are one, we distinguish between that which is the one God, which is what the Father, Son, and Spirit are. They are one God. And the who, Father, Son, and Spirit, is who the one God is. We believe that God is eternal love. But that love is possible because the Father loves the Son from all eternity. The Son is the Son and loves His Father from all eternity. And the Holy Spirit is the love, the infinite love, the infinitely personal love, who's an infinite person between them. Now, this is not in any way a, an undoing of the teachings of Torah. Because we, we, in fact, in the same creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit who has spoken to us through the prophets. That the prophets of the Old Testament prepare the way and they point towards the Messiah. And in various ways, they did say, and it's the prophets who did say, that the Old Covenant was broken. Again, that's Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 37. You know, these passages speak of it being broken. Christ then says, in the light of the, the, the prophets, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying the covenant was broken and promising, both of them promising a new covenant, Christ is the one who says that this is it. But he doesn't do it just as, it would be a nice idea to have a new covenant. No, he does so with divine authority. That's where you found that joy and that peace. I would urge you to meditate more deeply on Jeremiah 31, 
in the other passage I mentioned from Ezekiel. You can find them in that, in that book and in the programs I've done the last few weeks. Take a look and take time and listen to what the Lord God says to you about the covenant being broken and the new covenant being started. Put those two together and see if that helps. I hope it will. And you're in my prayer. You're very much in my prayer. And please keep me in yours. God bless you. Very much, Jesse. God bless you. Let's now go to another call here. Patricia. Patricia, where are you calling from? Hello? Are you asking for Patricia? I am. Is there a Patricia in the house? I hear you. I, I think it might be my phone. Uh, recently I heard you and on call to communion. What do you mean by the Old Testament being allegoric? Okay. Well, do you know what's an allegory? Do you know? No. Okay. All right. This is something very important. You know that th there are allegories in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where some, there, there's one point, one event that also, it's a real event, but it speaks to something coming in the future. So, for instance, in the book of Exodus, we see that Moses is told to celebrate the Passover and that a lamb is to be sacrificed and the blood of that lamb is to be put on the doorposts and on the lintel of the door. And there, so you see that that is an event that happened. But then it also is an allegory that points forward because later on we see how Jesus is identified by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that his blood is put on the cross piece, on the cross, instead of on the doorpost and the lintels, it's something that is put on the cross. And that just as the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel saved the people of Israel from the angel of death, so also does Christ's blood on the cross save us from eternal death. So it's an allegory that points forward, or it's a typology that points forward toward what Christ did. It's a real event that happened, but it also points forward towards Christ as a symbol. And we help understand what Christ is doing and what Christ did helps us understand what was going on in the Old Testament. They go together. Does that help you, Patricia? Yes, yes. That makes sense? Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Can, can I? Uh, I received in the mail. I don't, have you ever been to uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania? No, I have not. The, the chance to have a shrine. Well, right. I'll, I'll just read. I've been out of school 62 years. Yet, Boja, Jecha, Jesus, Christus, Wokoswami, Vam, E, Obdarja, Stravium. Okay, Father Mitch. All right, it's, 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 uh, Yek Benja Pok, uh, Pok Falon, Jesus Christus? So, this is, is this to tell him, uh, tell so, him, yeah, it's, it's saying, may Jesus Christ be Christ. praised. May Jesus, the Nyek is, May, you know, it's, it's uh, so may Jesus Christ be praised and may you be blessed. Okay? All right, I think we got it there. All right, now we have another caller. Hello, Rich. Hi, Father. Where Rich. are you calling from? Butler, Pennsylvania. Wonderful. And what are you asking about? Okay, I just want to know after the tomb was open and Jesus was walking around how long of a period of time that was and how many people did he interact with that either knew him or didn't know him or sure recognize? sure um according to first corinthians 
chapter 15, the first six verses, it was about, uh, there, there was a number of appearances, and he says to James, to Peter, to the, the three women, then to all the apostles in the upper room, and then to disciples, you know, at the Sea of Galilee. And then at one point, he met, 500 people saw him. So you're talking about something like 550 people at least that are listed in the various uh, apparitions of Christ res uh, after he rose from the dead. And St. Paul adds, a lot of these people are still alive today. Now, he was writing that in 54 A.D. Does that help? I guess he's gone. All right, yeah, so it's about 550 people uh, that we know of saw him. All right, and then we have uh, an email from James in Statham, Georgia. Father Packer, I'm watching your series on the Eucharist um, on demand, EWTN on demand. I just finished segment 14. You expound on John 6 very well. However, I'm still having trouble understanding. At the Last Supper, when Jesus gave the bread and wine, which were his body and his blood to the disciples, he wasn't then missing any flesh or any blood. Can you help me out here? I'm glad I found it on EW10. Also, I'm reading your book, Wheat and Tares. I hope you find that helpful. Um, this is a tremendous crisis of you know, the sexual abuse crisis in the church. And uh, my book, Wheat and Tares, is meant to help us to pray through it, help me praying through various aspects of the crisis as I wrote it. It took a long time for me to write that book, but it, I think it was, it was very helpful for me and hope it's helpful for you to pray through this crisis. In terms of the Last Supper, his body and blood weren't missing. There's no missing flesh. Right, there still isn't, and there never will be that in the Eucharist, Jesus' body and blood is never diminished. Remember, the Eucharist is the representation of his saving death in an unbloody way. And it will never be any kind of diminishment of his body or his blood. He doesn't lose anything, not one molecule, not one atom. It's rather the infinity of his divine nature that makes possible this Eucharistic gift. And that it will, uh, just as with the multiplication of loaves and fish, which is the basis for John chapter 6, that's what instigated that whole discussion, that there was plenty for everybody to eat of the loaves and the fish, that nobody went hungry, and there was leftovers. So also with the body of Christ and his precious blood, there's never going to be any diminishment. So he didn't have to diminish. The, it's, power, it's present because of his divinity, and he makes that infinitely possible. And then, real quickly, uh, from a lady named Angelica, Father Paco, I work in a fast-paced trauma center as a nurse. I want to know what prayer could be saying in my head for people as we are working to save them. I usually pray the Hail Mary and Our Father, but I want to know if I should pray something specific for mercy on their soul. You know, Angelica, praying the Our Father and the Hail Mary is great in those kind of situations. <laughs> when I had my heart attack, that's all I could manage. I couldn't say much more than that because it hurt. And you just couldn't give much more to that. But you might also do this. Pray the, uh, the Divine Mercy chaplet prayers. You don't have to say the whole chaplet. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Um, take that petition and make that yours at that moment and pray for them because those people who are in trauma 
that you're talking about need God's mercy. God bless you for praying for them. Bless you for that. And all of us need to do the same. We've run out of time. Hope you have a blessed, blessed Christmas. And get the chance to come back to church as soon as the politicians ease up. Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, thank you for your generosity. Please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. We'll pay our bills and present you wonderful celebrations of this holy season of Christmas. Thank you, and God bless. Mm -hmm.